Bring some energy to this this room. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, game masters. And this one is live, folks. We are here on Discord at FredoniaCon. I am, of course, Dan. With me, of course, is Josh and everybody else. Say hi, Josh. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is we episode sixty six zero. Every 60 or so, we'll do a live one. I'm just teasing. And I see people dropping off already. So great. I've already annoyed a few folks. Um, <laughs> but today, we're going to answer all kinds of questions. We already have some in advance, and you can po post some in the chat. Josh will get to them as well. If you have any questions for us about today's episode or anything else you want to hear Josh talk about, uh, feel free to email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, I talk fast. We're booked for an hour. We got to get all this stuff in. So anybody who is a regular listener knows... Uh we usually run over and that's even with editing and yes. out silences and all, and all that, that sort of thing. Before yeah. we get into those, I do want to mention because I brought it up um, offline with Dan at our last recording session. Um, as of right now, if mm -hmm. I refresh our, our page stats here, we have uh, 20,928 plays slash downloads. Um, which is over the, the course of, you know, year the, the little bit, a little bit more than a year that we've been doing this, our estimated yeah. audience, uh, 185 listeners. Um, that's, that's basically right. estimated on, you know, the number of plays that an episode gets within, uh, the, um, initial time frame. So we've got a small, but great audience that sends us, sends in questions and we appreciate uh, the fact that we've got people along for this ride that we have going on. Exactly. Uh, so to that point, we have a couple of emails to get to. Um, I'm going to give us one real quick from Dustin, who sent us a boatload of questions on Astral Sight and Astral Sense. And so he says, Josh and Dan, thanks for tackling these in detail. This was a really helpful episode. The key to unlocking most of my fuzziness on the subject was clarification that for beings wholly in astral space, there is no distinction between form and imprint. I definitely feel a little more confident dealing with astral space in my own games now, Dustin. So we did some good. There we go. Yeah, I, I, that helped. I hope I gave the right answers. <clears throat> Sounds I like I did. If I, if I helped him out, then those are the right answers. So speaking of astral space, we got like four of the six questions on astral space. So I figured we just kind of lean into those and yeah. kind of knock well, those out. People who That's sent in questions after we had actually recorded the astral space episode, but followed up with their yeah. own questions. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of like having a two-parter almost. Uh, hello to the both of you. First, repeating myself, best podcast ever for the best RPG ever. Secondly, you want questions for Astral Sight. Here we go. One, information gleaned. When GMing, I like to describe an astrally witness structure in a loose, vague mood that somehow gives an impression of what the philosophy of a pattern is. Even if it's just a quick glance with Astral Sight. Looking at a horror construct, the structure might be thorny, twisted, or seem to have eyes. Looking at a dwarven hammer, the structure might feel squarish and rigid, etc. Is there an official stance on this? I think I remember similar descriptions from the olden novels. Uh, the official stance is much like we discussed in the Astral Sight episode. Um, whatever impressions and images and stuff that you think will get across the ideas and notions that you want to the player who's doing the astral sensing, whatever works. Like both of those are really great. If um, anybody listened to my live reading of the first story in Talisman uh, back on Friday night uh, of the con, and that is recorded and will be available um, in various places soon. soon. I don't have links yet. But uh, that actually, that story does include some astral sensing as well we talked about prophecy when we were discussing that in that episode and how that novel has a lot of astral sight stuff going on but the first story actually includes both a wizard and a windling doing astral sensing of items and it actually brings up in that story that they have different impressions of the item from from their assessment of it they're looking at the same thing and they see different things uh so not even being aware at the time, you know, it is absolutely possible, like I said, that astral sight will be translating information that you normally don't have access to into sensory impressions of any kind to try and convey that. And so, yeah, thorny, twisted, like delve into your, into your adjectives and 
all of that sort of thing. With it. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, visibility through materials. I model the visibility of patterns kind of like a light source. I cannot hide a very bright flashlight under a thin veil of linen, so hiding the stone of omnipotence under a shirt won't fly. Hiding it in a carefully crafted wooden box? Probably yes. A question that arises from this model is that if light would bounce off other patterns and therefore be visible around a corner or something, much like you can see that there's a light in a room through a door without seeing the light bulb directly, I am not sure about this, but probably would reserve this for exceptionally powerful patterns. Thoughts? Um, yeah, the issue is thinking of astral sight as, and the, like, there's a lot of descriptions where astral space glows and patterns have energy and so forth that kind of conveys mm -hmm. that idea of them shedding off light. But remember that that is merely a metaphor for the information that is being conveyed to you by astral the space. astral sight talent. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, if it works for the particular needs of the scene or story that you're going with, a super powerful item, like you might not be able to just, you know, stick it in your pocket and have it be concealed. That might be difficult, but that's something that I would absolutely handle on a case by case basis and probably only in extremes. I talked about, I think, how if you go back and you look at Classic, which I did mm -hmm. a lot of the, the work on revising um, the writing, editing the writing for Astral Space and Astral Sensing and stuff, and came up with a lot of convoluted multiple success level multiple test stuff to see magic items through other items and things like that it adds a lot of complexity to the system that now looking back on it 15 10 15 years later um i don't think really adds any value to the game and it's just a lot easier again barring exceptional circumstances to just basically say your sensing doesn't you know, doesn't doesn't go through other stuff, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Um, it's just a lot easier and I think makes it easier for people who are not as deeply invested in the metaphysics of the setting to adjudicate on the fly what might be going on as far as what a magician or somebody with astral sight sees when they turn that extra sense on. Okay. Number three, pattern center points. If I remember correctly, patterns of, say, thread items are said to not fill the physical form, but only a tiny point within the physical form. What's the design reasoning behind that? Uh, not necessarily the case. Okay. Some, th some magical patterns will only fill a portion of the item, of the magical item that they're associated with. That is certainly a possibility but it is not necessarily the case or, or even universal. Usually that's something that you would reserve for a situation where that is a clue itself as to the nature of the item or something like that. Um, a, 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 a magic sword where the, the true pattern is, for example, centered on the stone in the pommel rather than in the blade or in the entire item itself might give clues as to what type of bonuses it provide. It might clues give clues into the history of the item that maybe the stone was something separate as a, as a magic item on its own that was then incorporated into the sword and that has expanded it. Um, so that's something that is certainly possible, but is not, it's not a, does I, I wouldn't consider that to be a design thing except in the sense that you are designing the story of the item and how those clues might connect to stuff. Fair enough. Number four, and this is the last from Jan, uh, AKA uh, Nanander. Maybe, and this is names, maybe just loosely related, but in older editions, names, air quotes, in themselves were discussed rather profoundly, something that the fourth edition seems to have not indulged in so much. Change of philosophy, lack of space, chapter in the upcoming magic supplement, hee hee. Um, I don't think there's anything specifically planned for that in the next magic supplement. I think it's a little bit of a change of philosophy 
um, well, not philosophy. It's more of a change of focus because one of the big things that comes up when it when you get involved with discussions of names and true names and stuff like that is it invariably comes over to renaming and questions that come up relating to that and how you might change like how a person you know an adept might take on a new name and all sorts of really esoteric largely super edge case kind of things um for the vast majority of people names and naming like names are important but i don't want to put too much emphasis on that importance within the general scope of magic theory because then you might get focused on the wrong aspect of it um which i think should be more on especially if you're talking about thread items and whatnot is how does that incorporate into story and the the campaign arcs that you might be tying into the the development of a magic item and that sort of thing fair enough so thank you jan for those questions on astral space uh leading into a few more we've got some from lee says hi guys really good session this week thank you for your continued efforts always i have a couple of suggestions for ideas on how to view astral space from a couple of book series i read many moons ago uh catherine kerr's the Devery cycle, the Devery cycle. Uh, for those with, with the sight, people have a body of light. Humans are sort of globular, elves are flame-like. All living things radiate light, i.e. with plant life having a reddish glow that fades as winter deepens. Her take on it is more, root, more rooted in Celtic themes than Earth Dawn, though. I don't think that's a bad a bad analogy, and I, I like the, the fact that she's got some color and some shapes in, involved in that. Uh, and then David Gimmel's The Draenei series. The magic is again more Celtic with the The 30, forming bodies of light again. One of the books describes an untrained warrior having his etheric double being forced into astral space, and the scene describes his view of it and how he resolved the problem. So astral space and shard realms weren't really covered, uh, but Raymond Feist has the Rift War series, The Garden, and The Hall of Doors, I believe novels. Uh, last random thought that GMs may want to consider occasionally, the MacGuffin that the adepts need but can't find is exactly where they were told it would be, but it was placed in its location by someone or something using netherwalk or displace. They will need to find some way to retrieve it from astral space. Thoughts, Josh? Uh, those any... are all good. I have not read the Catherine Kurtz stuff, so I can't address that specifically. Um, I have read some Feist, but the novels that they mention, I can't recall them particularly. But yeah, any kind of... It sounds like there's... You know, some kind of magic site that allows whoever to you to view magical energies or, or whatever and drawing from those for inspiration for your own descriptions of astral space and the kind of stuff you might get from them i think is absolutely valid and useful even if the specifics of the magic theory don't necessarily line up one to one um no. what was inspiration the second everywhere. yeah what was the second uh, david gimmel's the Drenai series Okay, I haven't read that either. I am woefully behind. These are my... all new to me, so yeah. I'm, I'm I'm underread compared to most uh, fantasy games. But I thought there was another point that was brought up at the end, not necessarily talking about. Yeah. Um. The last random thought was that the MacGuffin that helps the adepts that the adepts need to find but can't find oh. is exactly what they were told it would be, but it's placed there in astral space by either Netherwalk or Displace. Yeah, that's that's a cool idea. Um, I like you know, there's not. Because of the dangers of astral space in general, there is not a lot of focus given on cross-dimensional stuff the way that you would say with the ethereal and Dungeons and Dragons, for example. Um, now, depending on the group, that could be a very easy solution um, because of spirits who might be able to open a portal or you know various other things it, it it might be possible to you know get around that obstacle without too much effort but if you have a group that doesn't necessarily have easy access to that it could provide a very interesting wrinkle fair enough all right on to the next from aaron this is a long one but i'll get through it uh hi guys apologies but life took over for a little while and i had a, a fallen a few weeks behind on the edsg and i've just caught up on astral space episode from a couple of weeks back and wanted to share my personal Im imagery of astral space first off the ordinary world reflected in astral space 
Imagine a grayscale version, maybe slightly blurred definition on the surroundings, and then an eerie mist that thickens with the level of taint in the area. Not unlike the Upside Down from Stranger Things TV show, or maybe when Frodo puts on the ring in Lord of the Rings movies. And then for patterns, a non-magically awakened name giver may have a circular light emitting from their center mass, similar to a candle light, as the name giver grows, ages, weakens or strengthens, or, or their general health improves or deteriorates. The brightness of the candle may flicker or brighten or dim. Once that person becomes an adept, they develop a ring around this with threads stretching from the center to this ring to look like a small dream catcher. Second circle adds another ring. Third circle, and so forth, on with each attached thread, some form of magical talent or spell known by the adept. Additional disciplines may appear in different color threads. The bigger the legend, the brighter the light emitted from the center in the surrounding circles and threads, eventually becoming a big dream catcher made of magical energy perceived as light. And... If someone was to perceive a taint well enough with astral sight or another similar talent, they may notice that these threads and circles have formed knots or have come loose in places with a darker illumination instead of a bright one. I imagine spell threads to be similar to look at, but then less static extension of the caster's pattern, able to extend the effects to their targets. Would this be an acceptable vision of astral space, or do you feel there is an improvement or addition to be made somewhere along these lines? No, I think that's pretty good. Um, the one place that I would probably differ would be not to go quite so specific in terms of the number of rings that get added based on the adept's circle kind of thing. That feels to me like it's a little bit too... On the nose? Yeah, a little too on the nose, a little too mechanistic, um, not in line with what I kind of see, which is to say that while more powerful adepts would, because of their interactions with magic and their magical ability, probably have brighter, more complex patterns uh, and so forth, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that someone of who is not an adept, but equally important in some regard, um would be like uh for example um king Barrelus the third who i think mm -hmm. was it was said he was a questor but he was not actually an adept that was revealed at any point i imagine that his pattern would be because of his importance and the decisions that he's made and the interactions that he has had with other living things and important events and all of that would have a very complex pattern and, you know, and might look and might appear to be in one sense more magically powerful than his actual magical abilities or lack thereof might indicate because patterns grow and change according to their interactions with magic. And so that's kind of what I would see. And that while you could probably get a general idea of an adept's like you could maybe make a good guess at an adept's power level based on a reading of their pattern, especially someone who has, say, a, a decently high pattern craft score and has the ability to to look at the pattern. That's what I would kind of use as a, as a role for that kind of study. Um, to get maybe a general sense of, are they a novice, likely a novice, a journeyman, like how magically important, which may or may not correlate at all to their importance in other areas, but that's, but but nope. overall, like the idea of it, you know, kind of being kind of like a really elaborate dream catcher kind of thing. That's that's cool imagery. I love the imagery and the creativity of that. Just the interwoven connectedness, and not necessarily all in straight spider web patterns and things like that. So I I I love the imagery. I was kind of trying to use that for the longest time. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Dig that entirely. Um, kind of off of astral space, because I think we caught all those up a little bit. We got a, a quick one from Riley. Uh, while this may be already in the plan, I wanted to ask you to include recommendations for both in general and maybe even individually per passion, how you would introduce the passions in game to new players, ways and techniques that help people understand how they differ from traditional gods, but the importance they still hold in the setting. Been enjoying the podcast. Thank you for the continued good work, Riley. That's a good suggestion. Um, yeah, I, we talked about Astandar and Jaspery last time. And yeah, Corolla's are coming up soon. Yeah, um, but we can like address his question of those. Of 
in that episode but i was thinking like can we address that for for these two um yeah it's we i think we kind of covered we, how to we, introduce well yeah we, we well we talked about we talked about introducing them in like adventures how you could use them potentially for story hooks and how quest doors or followers of passions might become involved in different adventures or adventure types yeah um but what we didn't really address was if you've got somebody that is new to earth dawn and this is i think the question the the key point of the question that he brought up I think you're right yes is someone who is coming to earth dawn and might be carrying with them the baggage of dungeons and dragons gods Deities deities yeah. or even just the the you know the which largely is is part and parcel of the whole fantasy genre in a way is there's there's a, a lot of cases um how would you without i i suspect without just sort of lore vomiting at them <laughs> um how you would introduce the concept of the passions both in general and perhaps individual passions without like sort of organically into the game and i'm not sure um right off the top of my head how i might do that um I think the one to start with, which we mentioned on the previous episode, is Garlen. Yeah. Because everybody seeks out Garlen to heal. And if it has any healing aids on them, then you have to go maybe introduce somewhere. There's a shrine or a little tiny village or something along those lines that happens to have a, a quest or, or a follower of Garlen. And maybe that's the way to introduce, well, this is one of the passions. Not, you know, like I said, it's more of the pantheon of Greek or Roman gods. And so it's not just one's not monotheistic, but it's, that's kind of how to lace that in a little bit just to go, here's how to introduce them to your players in the most genial way possible. As in, you need a healer, let's get you over there. Yeah, I would also probably lean into the idea that there's not necessarily a huge overarching religious organization tied to them. Yes. That they go to the the Questor of Garlin there or whatever, and that they're just dealing with them as an individual, the same way that they might deal with um you know, a, a weaponsmith, the you know, the local weaponsmith or some other kind of figure like that, where people, you know, more expect the sort of traditional solo operator, whereas mm -hmm going to what people would conceive of as a, a priest or religious figure typically has some kind of organizational backing behind them. Not that there isn't in some aspects yeah. of Earth Dawn, but that though that those early interactions are going with individuals that are perhaps pursuing the goals of or the 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 ideals of their passion within the context of an adventure and perhaps even um having rivals we talked about that with um astendar and having mm -hmm. like rival artists both sort of competing for something and and having that kind of idea and so getting away from the notion of a questor as a priest or cleric that has to answer to higher authorities really the only higher authority that any individual questor needs to answer to is their patron passion and so maybe introducing that the idea of questors as lone agents um as opposed to agents of some greater hierarchy would be one of the ways that you could introduce that special flavor that the passions have when it comes to earth dawn Okay. Uh, one more one more email about the passions and questers. Hi there. This is from Brian. Uh, as you're going through the passions in these podcasts, I was just wondering if you might be up for spending a bit of time for each passion, highlighting what a person who is a follower, but not a questor, might do to show their devotion. I think, for example, with Corollas, we might get some good examples in the Trevar source book, but what might a person who feels more strongly inclined towards the ideals of Jaspri or Thistonius or Floranius 
to do to express that even if their level of devotion is not strong enough or focused enough to make them a questor. It seems like for every questor, there might be there must be at least a dozens, if not hundreds of people who are inclined towards one passion or another, but who don't go all in on dedicating their life to the ideals of one specific passion. Perhaps even some consideration for how people might invoke the various passions in general. I'm sure all farmers would call on Jasper to bless their fields, and all blacksmiths would want Uppendahl's blessing on their forge, but I don't think they would all count as questers by any means, and many of those farmers might believe that Uppendahl is just as important as Jasper for providing tools that make their work, their work less backbreaking. And many of those blacksmiths might believe that Jasper is equally important to their work because, after all, the resources they use to make things frequently come from Jasper's domain. Just a thought, or possibly a few, Brian. That's actually a very good point. Um, yes. Where your average non-questor person in a, a town or city or village would likely invoke the blessings of the appropriate passion based on what they were doing. There's a lot mm -hmm. of discussion in the Trevar book of the importance of Corollas. And Trevar, being a very merchant-focused city, does have a lot of dedication to Corollis. Um, but there is discussion in that book as well about other passions and, and how they manifest in the day-to-day -day life of folks. Um, but yeah, um, Astendar, I imagine, would be invoked most frequently by our, our sort of art, our artisan types. Um are, you know, musicians, artists, uh, anybody that's doing sort of sort of creative artwork. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you would potentially see even craftsmen doing work that might traditionally be associated with uh, Upandal to also invoke Astendar to perhaps add her, their grace or whatever to the, the work that's, or, you know, the, the item that is being produced. Um, but outside of that, Astendar would probably most likely be invoked by those uh, pursuing uh, romantic relationships um, and that sort of thing because of Astendar's association with love and associated stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it would be, you know, likely if there isn't a dedicated location in a particular town or village for the worship of a particular passion, um, then you might find houses have small shrines that are set up either to the passions in general or perhaps dedicated to uh, one or two of the passions that are most aligned with whatever practices are done by the folks that live there um, you would likely find probably it would not be surprising to find small shrines to garland set up in you know the family room of a home uh, even mm -hmm. if it's not huge or anything like that and perhaps um, at special occasions a a small token offering or something like that might be made um, you know uh, one of the um, I feel like there's some kind of anthropological reference that I should point people to to those kinds of practices but I don't want to get it wrong uh, in terms of where it might originate from but um, looking into perhaps um, some uh, animistic traditions um, mm -hmm. maybe drawing a little bit of inspiration from places that that practice a kind of ancestor worship um, things like that where you are in a sense petitioning specific spiritual individuals spiritual entities to provide their blessings mm -hmm. or support or whatever um you know might be appropriate to to draw some inspiration from all right uh i think on the questers and passion first episode we let out so uh quick little sidetrack and full disclosure this is from from somebody in my gaming group themselves and they would take my word for it so they wanted josh's opinion on this question uh just want you to know i love the podcast and listen to it weekly keep up the awesomeness i had a question for josh we had a scenario that came up where a step two which is d4 minus one if i understand this right maxing it out would then explode but minus one for each roll added as well 
or is the minus one only applied a single time, no matter how far it explodes? I run it as the minus one is only applied at the end. Agreed. Um, that's how I've run my. That's that's how I've well. always run it, and I just grabbed the book off the shelf to see if it actually says in the rules. Mm -hmm. Um. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Normally speaking, all this dead air gets cut out at the final podcast steps, production. Steps. <laughs> um, if for it, so this is on page 33 of the player's guide, fourth edition player's guide, uh, under there steps one and two. If for any reason you do need to roll dice at these steps, total any bonus die rolls before subtracting the modifier from the result. So the modifier is minus one. So, so, do that if, one so it's, time. yeah, so it's D4 minus one. You roll the d4. If you roll a bonus die, you keep going. That you just subtract the one once. Um, yep. I think. I'm pretty it sure that's does been consistent. Weird thing. I, I'm pretty sure that's consistent. I think it does weird. It does slightly different things to the average results if you subtract it from each. Uh, I have not done the mathematical study of that in quite some time, so I can't recall right off the top of my head. No, that's fair. That's like an Excel spreadsheet chart type thing. I mean, not uh, not not super weird when you're dealing with step numbers that low anyway. But yeah. yes, it is just once you subtract it at the end of everything. Uno. Uh, so second question from Vince. Uh, if a character has an initiative penalty due to armor that brings down, that brings the step, their final step down to zero, are they not, not able to wear the armor or how is that handled? Uh, reason for him is that he has a dwarf elementalist that started with a step four for Dex, and he's wearing apparently plate armor, so uh, he's down like four steps down to zero. So, how would you run that? I just say you go last. You don't even um, have to roll your initiative. Step. You yeah, just go last. I I think there's also something in the player's guide about that. Um, what about they should read the books? No, I know. <laughs> I know. God. Um, but I'm now, not, folks. I, questions so while josh looks this up this is your chance to actually put all your questions in the chat and we'll get to them so write them all out type them all out whatever you whatever you got throw them at us we've got a little less than half an hour left i suspect it's, it's the great thing about a podcast is usually it's a free form end we can end at 35 minutes we can end at an hour and a half but today we're booked for an hour so we're gonna so, try and yeah so page 412 of the player's guide well, there we go. Initiative penalties. This is in the armor section of the equipment chapter. A I'm going to rules, people. A character cannot wear a set of armor or carry a shield if doing so would reduce his base initiative below step one. So technically, if it's reducing it to zero, you shouldn't be able to wear it. Yes. Um, I realize that kind of uh, sucks for low dex characters um like an elementalist who decides to go with step four for their initiative uh, with their dexterity it means that yeah. they're you know the types of armor that the types of protection that they are able to put on um mm -hmm. it also does tend to uh provide even more emphasis on dexterity as an important stat which already is doing a lot of heavy lifting in the system as far as that um yeah. and i think part of the there were a couple of knacks in the I think it's companion. mystic pat and whether it's i think it's you're right it might be in the companion there are a couple of knacks that relate to wearing heavier armor um i don't know whether those would be particularly applicable to a um an elementalist but if they're a dwarf i think they're available to dwarves i don't nope. have those right to hand but look into those um yeah i do not have off the top of my head an easy solution to that um then don't wear that armor and yeah you decks. basically um <laughs> you know <laughs> At that point, you you look into thread armor that provides reductions in initiative penalty as you weave higher rank threads so that yeah. you can get higher protection without being encumbered by it. Um, I don't know. But yes, to answer his question, he is actually not able to do that if the armor is reducing his initiative penalty to zero. He shouldn't be able to, by the rules, wear that armor. Cool. 
Thank you, Vince. Uh, as I said, that kind of ends our uh, prepared email questions, but we can also go by the, the chat here, what we have. So yeah, it, just, it just got mentioned in the chat um, by Sebastian. Morgan does have a rules variant on his blog that may be worth mentioning. Uh, so go out and check Morgan's blog, uh, Panda Gaming Grove, and mm -hmm. look for that. I don't know where it is right off the top of my head, but yeah, I, I recognize that as a problem just based on the like as a potential problem based on the way that the the rules work um so that might be worth something looking into fair uh let's see we've also got falal katan vras who's written into us once before uh, with regard to the shrines and passions the greek and roman shrines and their homes are similar to what you were what you talked about yeah i know that's why i brought it up <laughs> josh is so learned well i i talk a good game um yeah that's but the whole like, point. Yeah, well, I am I am learned within certain certain environments, certain sure, spheres yeah. of knowledge. Hence my reluctance to go. I know there are things outside of Western European traditions that probably address this, but I don't know those well enough to speak off the cuff authoritatively about them. Exactly. Uh, so if nobody has any posted questions, maybe they want to uh, push to talk and actually get their voice on the podcast. Uh, referring to the idea of hiding something in astral space, could a spirit be summoned and retrieve it via its manifest power? Um, I well, wow, bring the bring the deep question. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, let me. I'm in I'm inclined to go with uh, uh, Cliff's thing, uh, not exactly hand waving, but yeah, I'm inclined to go with yeah. that at the start before I get you know rules deep. But yeah, that sounds uh, like I a would... story wrinkle. Um, I think that makes it I, I think that makes it too easy. There's nothing in the without going and looking up at the actual text, but the way that I think of the manifest power, basically the manifest power allows the spirit to cross back and forth between astral space and physical space. And there's nothing in there that says, like there's nothing by default that allows the spirit, like a spirit couldn't dematerialize, a spirit couldn't reverse manifest mm -hmm. uh, and take somebody and take a person with them across right. into astral space. So I would be inclined to say that barring some kind of special power, they can't do it just by manifest because that's a that's a power that basically all spirits have and it just seems to be too easy a solution to incorporate the, that the, yeah to the purpose of <clears throat> hiding something in astral space that way fair enough let's see what else we got oh yeah somebody actually posted uh morgan's rules already on the uh variant uh, yeah, look under rules. It's parent rules variant ten part one hindrance, where he probably talks about some of the very things that I brought up in regards to the mechanical concerns with how <laughs> initiative penalties work. Morgan and I have talked in the past about some of the more fiddly game systems mm -hmm. that are legacies of Earth Dawn's genesis and how it was a response to things at its time of its original creation and things yeah. that uh carried on um you know sort of since then and things that we kind of wanted to address but i wasn't comfortable going too crazy as far as revisions to the mechanics um no massive overhaul yeah not overhauls in certain areas but not in others um I have since become a little bit more uh, daring, daring a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more confident in my abilities to do stuff. Um, somebody did also mention in the chat um, with regards to initiative zero about the gauntlet. Yeah, that is a different situation. What you're talking about with the gauntlet and the powers that they have, you can with certain gauntlet powers actually reduce your initiative results to zero that but is that... different but then having an initiative reducing your initiative step to zero um there are special rules that apply to the gauntlet as far as those powers interact with the initiative count that is the result of your initiative test that determines when you're acting um 
at least within fourth edition. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that in earlier editions, there were rules or got suggestions in place about how to handle somebody who perhaps through penalties or whatever might have their initiative step reduced below zero or below one and what might come about as a result of that. I don't think that we've really addressed that in fourth edition. I don't recall anything, but doesn't mean I'm right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the gauntlet is a good thing to, to bring up in that regard, but the gauntlet's a slightly different case because it's talking about initiative results and not base initiative steps. Step. Yeah, fair. So uh, I'm not seeing any other questions out there. Anybody really have anything? Any any questions in general, even not necessarily relating to that, but where you've got yeah. us here Podcast. live? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always curious. I was always want to ask Josh before we begin recording exactly how many books he has on the bookshelves behind him. And I don't think he, he can count that. I, I know he can count that high. I can count that uh, high. I don't think we have enough time for me to count that high. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are catching the stream and they have seen this wall of books behind me uh, in all of the streams that we've been doing here this weekend. Um, and it is kind of a mess. Um, but I've pointed out what uh, the various sections of stuff are. I've got my my dice bags, one of which has uh, the friend of mine actually made with the embroidered uh, Thrall Triskelion logo on it. Um, regarding, oh, there's a question. Um, let's see. Uh, Maddie says he's more than a little curious as to what is on your shelves. Um, those shelves up, I guess, presumably the ones visible behind you there in the uh in the stream uh what is on my shelves honestly enough is so this is my firefly collection and so these are almost all the figures that came in the uh firefly loot crates the only one i'm missing is kaylee uh because oh, i missed one that's the worst one to miss it was the first one that was why i missed it because it was the first one I had my it wasn't signed up in, in advance fast enough otherwise i've got the the ship papers, the Yahtzee uh, version of Firefly, all these, yeah, all these little Christmas ornament fireflies right behind me as well. The the placard, so everything came from the loot crates mostly. These are all, all Firefly things. Okay. Um, regarding brown. <laughs> regarding the passions, would you encourage competition between different followers? Um, hmm. yeah. Uh, we yeah, mentioned can... that, like. Certainly, if if they are not necessarily working toward the same goal, the way that you have, say, for example, the, the batch of Questors of Jaspery that are set up in Trosk outside the Badlands and all kind of working towards the goal of solving the problem of what's going on there. Um, That's healthy you, competition. Well, but you can absolutely have, I mean, Floranus is a patron of ship captains, in a sense, mm -hmm. with, with their devotion or focus on on energy and motion and whatnot and so having rival captains be competing but both being dedicated to floranus um Thistonius is huge on like he's like all about challenge and competition um he absolutely <laughs> loves it when his followers compete against each other oh, yeah uh, let the best stuff. one win. so absolutely i you know given appropriate circumstances i i don't think as long as the followers are pursuing the appropriate goals, mm -hmm. the the appropriate ideals for the passion. I don't think the passion would have any real problem with that, which can certainly bring its own wrinkle into what might be going on with stuff. Again, you don't have like the only power ultimately that a questor is responsible to is their patron. They yeah. do not have to be beholden necessarily to any other followers of the passion, as long as they are true to that ideal and to the, the pact in a sense that they have made with their patron. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's all, it's all cool. As far as I'm concerned, that's all, that's all story meat. <laughs> <laughs> Something to sink your teeth into. I'm good there. Yeah. Um, unarmed combat. How many enhancers can one use until it is no longer considered unarmed? Um, not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, you know, like claw shape is unarmed. You get a couple of things that with um, 
like oh like blood knuckles etc um i think generally unless the particular item in question specifies that it still uses unarmed combat it's no longer considered unarmed uh there were like the um and i don't i will be honest i don't think they've been introduced in fourth edition the um the talons the dingani talons um you know what i'm talking about dan right the the basically the the forearm the wolverine forearm claws that i think it's the dingani tribes use we talked about them back in the human episode however long ago that was um (laughs) they they were considered unarmed like they used unarmed combat to attack but they really those straddle the line for me um, yeah, that was always a, a, a nitpicky line to get over to go like that, that falls into melee instead yeah, of unarmed. When when things start straying into and it's it's like it's like obscenity. I can't define it, but I know when I know it when I see it. Um <laughs> the 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 feeling that you know, okay, now you are basically doing everything that you could do with a melee weapon but you're just using unarmed because that's your good stat like yeah. when it starts to feel a little abusive you know blood knuckles you know at that point you're still kind of punching things um beastmaster claw shape is okay because it's like an extension of their hand um mm-hmm. anytime you start kind of going beyond that the tiskrang like tail attachments i'm yeah. I'm iffy on, I'm going to strap a short sword to my tail, but use unarmed to fight with it. <laughs> um, like I understand that on one end, but that's really starting that like that's on that, on that blurry line for me. Yeah. I no, I'm, I'm with you on the, on the blurry line there. Um, let's see. So, so we found uh, the characters initiative is reduced below one involuntarily. Uh, they act on a one. So it's okay. page three seven two of the players guy so so essentially they go last yeah and that's and that's fine thank you uh sebastian for uh, for locating and- that that again but that doesn't um yeah that doesn't that is different from the i'm gonna wear enough armor that drops my initiative step penalty down yeah so somebody actually asked when is josh going to join me in reading some of the old legends as he has such a great storytelling voice as well well thank you um <laughs> If you missed it, I mentioned earlier in the show, I live streamed and recorded the first story in the collection Talisman back on Friday night. And that will be available online uh, to be heard. Uh, Part um, confession time. Part of the reason that I wanted to do that. Yeah. Andy now just said in the chat, my bedtime story, my bedtime story time must become a thing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I had brought this up to Ross like two years ago, asking if we had the the rights to do the Earth Dawn novels as audiobooks. Basically, yeah. at, God, I think it might have been even longer ago than that. I think it might have been like around the time that I was not working a day job and was recording a couple of audiobooks that yeah. I asked. asked. I know you've asked me about this I have. because I have I've done 30 audiobooks. Yeah. So I, I've um, offered to do all the Earth Dawn novels into audio. Right. Um, and the reason that you haven't is because I kind of want to, um, (laughs) we can trade off. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a matter of, of finding the, the production time, but yeah, if, if the reception on that was good, uh, then, you know, I can, I can devote a few hours of recording and post-production time, maybe in the midst of everything else to deadline, we can take our time and get it right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that, yeah, that's, that's, that's something we looked into as well as all those. Uh, so Rob uh, from the Name Givers actual play podcast says, for an example of a Florian who is coming into a campaign, the first few sessions of Name Givers leads to an appearance and a PC becoming a quester. Was a case where, where the player was not well versed with passions, but acted in a way that would aff- attract attention. And so the game master, him, brought this passion into the plot. I think it's a very fun way to bring in a passion if the player's uh, role playing starts to look a lot like a quester. That is actually a great idea. Um, if you have a player character that is behaving consistently and dramatically and largely 
in a way that would attract the attention of a particular passion. Um, mm -hmm. Having the passion actually appear um, is is really cool, even if it doesn't necessarily make them a questor, although you mm -hmm. can dangle that bit in front of them. <laughs> um, but the um, original... Um, uh, not the, not Longing Ring, I don't really think has, but I know that, um, the original trilogy, I think Mother Speaks definitely has appearances and, um, Poison Memories, the, the, the novels in the original Earth Dawn trilogy yeah. have the passions appearing to Jerol and the other yeah. characters as appropriate based on the, based on the circumstances. Um, gotcha. that's one thing actually that, that we hadn't talked about. Um, is that the passions can show up like they're oh, they can manifest and they they know. can manifest and do whatever. Um, yeah, that was one of the legends is how Thestonius gave us his spear. He actually shows up for that combat and helps defeat the the opponent and then hands off his spear to the person he was fighting alongside with. So yeah, they they do show up in person, you know, and. Uh, have direct contact with those people that are maybe not necessarily seeking them, but are needing to be in contact with them. So they, they do show up in person to say, by the way, we're real. How you doing? You know? Yeah. Sebastian mentions dream sequences. Um, if you are the type who's going to have a dream sequence and I've got to say, I love me a good dream sequence when I'm GMing players, I did an entire session that was a dream sequence and the players didn't realize it until about a little bit more than three quarters of the way through that they didn't realize it was a dream. I had an entire major villain in that campaign. That was a horror that basically revolved around the manipulation of dreams. Um, I, I love me messing with, with psychology and perception and stuff like that. Um, oh, no. so that works. Uh, I, I had to miss a couple of sessions, but my game master wrote my character back in through somebody else's dream or nightmare scenario uh, and so he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, your, your character was there just in a, in a dream session. Oh, good. I'm glad that I was still, you know, valid somewhere, but yeah, it, the more creative you get with, um, passions, I just find the, the creativity is endless in that regard. Cause you can throw them in, in a number of ways and I can't even list them all here today. So, um, K Scott yeah. asks, do harbingers of the passions exist in fourth edition? Ooh conceptually i would say yes but we do not have any kind of game mechanics for them mm -hmm. um it's not something we've talked about really um that's one of those areas that hasn't really come up in any of the the, the harbinger showed up in Creatures of Bar Save. Yeah. I think, I think the Harbinger showed up and there is something very samey about Harbinger. About like it within within the context that it was presented, mm -hmm. it feels kind of weird for all of the passions. And I may be misremembering details or stuff might not be sticking with me. But Fair. it feels to me a little bit conceptually bland for oh if a passion is pissed off at you they're going to send a harbinger and mm -hmm. yes the harbinger might have a little bit of flavor of the passion that they're associated with but they're all going to be this kind of like uber combat monster kind of thing and i mm -hmm. i i think there could be more to it than that let me put it that way um yeah. and you know perhaps one of the things that that morgan has mentioned here uh, and it has been brought up in, in stuff discussions this weekend is the dream project that actually he and I may end up working together on, which is the um, like deep astral realms, astral gazetteer, uh, nether realms kind of stuff. Um, actually discussing harbingers there. Uh, that seems like a nice thematic tie in and perhaps doing with harbingers similar to the kind of stuff that he's done with um, named spirits and uh, spirit binding secrets where yeah. like we, like we present sort of custom, maybe not even necessarily game stats for them, but mm -hmm. custom 
like images of of like what the harbingers of certain passions would be and it also feels to me a little bit weird that the passions because they can appear and manifest without that much trouble where appropriate in bar save and perhaps mm -hmm. places beyond why they would need to send an emissary if they're upset with somebody um <laughs> They just showed themselves. You know, except except perhaps as, oh, here is a challenge for a high circle party um mm -hmm. to fight something that's not the passion. Um there there's there's something very like angelic messenger aspect to them that doesn't quite thematically fit with the way that passions are. I don't know. There yeah. there are a few issues. Again, this is all spitballing off the top of my head. This is not involved in any kind of actual discussions that we have had <laughs> behind the time. behind the curtain. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's a good question. Um, it is. It's it's a great yeah. question, and there's a lot of a lot of space to explore there. Um, oh yeah, Aaron just can, can fill up a whole. I can say a volume on their own, but they are. Um, I can say underutilized, but I, I I'm looking forward to their fourth edition development and revision. Yeah, when 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 if when we finally get around to that, uh, we just got the um, the the wrap it up symbol from Andy. Oh, um, Andy, buzzkill. I'm kidding. So, I actually dropped dropped in like like five or ten minutes ago to to see how we're doing. Well, so. we we've got the this is actually the we've got the closing ceremonies after this. Um, right. This is the 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 tail end of Fredonia Con. Um, Andy, As I said, Andy Andy we're, suck. Suck. we're just the encore. So, <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for continuing to listen to our show. Uh, if you are not already. Uh, edsgpodcast at gmail.com is the address that you can send questions, comments, uh, table stories, suggestions, anything like that to us. We enjoy oh. getting that. Um, I want to hear it on the show next. Yeah. I mean, you we've got, got, we've got plenty of material. If you guys can't come up with anything, we will certainly find a way to waste an hour of your time a week. Um, <laughs> yeah. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, the official, um, the search for for edsg podcast, podcast yeah cast on twitter i think is the the edsg podcast in all of our um, social media uh it's sorry the actual twitter handle is earthed on g because i screwed up setting it up so it's earthed on g um there oh, yeah. i am at metaxas on twitter dan is at boys voice i am also mm -hmm. on facebook and various other things uh earth dawn guild blah 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 um if you're here for the live show you should know all of this stuff yeah pretty much. um thank you again <laughs> uh 60 episodes now under our belt hopefully yeah. many more to come with so much yeah. subject uh and dan you want to take us home I will wrap this up. So thank you all for making the time today for the hour that you had us. And it is now time for you to go send us questions about your legend. Have a good night, everybody.